Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG and uh, today we shall talk about another way to represent programs. We shall use direct and acyclic graphs to represent the instructions that constitute basic blocks. Direct and acyclic graphs, or DAGs for short, enable a family of compiler optimizations that we usually call local. Local, in the rest of the discourse, henceforth, will mean that we restrict ourselves to the context of a single basic block. So local optimizations mean optimizations that happen inside a basic block. Notice that there exist uh, other optimizations that are also called local, but that do not use DAGs as the core data structure. For instance, we shall see later about local register location and pipihole optimizations, which are not carried out onto direct acyclic graphs as the core data structure. In contrast, optimizations that see the entire control flow graph of a function are, are called global. Most of the optimizations that we will see in this course are global, but today we will look into local optimizations. In particular, we shall talk about optimizations that happen over DAGs. That means that the implementation of these optimizations use DAGs as the core data structure that will guide the implementation of said optimizations. DAGs are graphs, and when they represent programs, we build them as follows. The vertices represent memory locations, that is, um, the places where we can store the values of variables. The edges represent dependence relations. We say that an instruction u depends on an instruction v if u uses variables that are defined by v. As an example, take a look into this program on the left. The program is formed by four instructions. What they do is not really important. We will care only about the relations between the instructions. Let's see how to represent the program using a DAG. So here it is, the directed acyclic graph that represents this program. Can you try to figure out how we produce this DAG out of that program? It's not that difficult, actually. Let's call the variables that have no definition the inputs. For each input node, we create a vertex. Then, for each instruction, we create a new vertex. So, if an instruction defines a variable v with an operation op, then we create a vertex that represents v and is labeled with the operation op. We then add the edges. For each variable used in that instruction, there will be an edge from the node where that variable is defined to the new vertex that we have just created. Now, can you think about ways to optimize the program? By optimization, I mean removing instructions that are not necessary, for instance, or perhaps removing computations that are redundant. Let's focus on the second possibility, removing redundant nodes. Can you think about a way to discover redundant nodes? A node is redundant if its value has been computed already. For instance, the fourth instruction is computing some something that has already been calculated by the second instruction. Take a look into the program to see it. So we say that the fourth instruction that defines d is redundant. Indeed, the value of d is the same as the value of b which is computed by the second instruction. We can modify the algorithm that creates the nodes to eliminate redundancies. Can you think about how to do it? Well, basically, before creating a node, we check if the DAG, the DAG, already contains an equivalent vertex. Two vertices are equivalent if they contain the same operation label and the same sequence of input edges. But checking equivalence is not so trivial. Can you think about problems that would emerge when proving that two nodes are equivalent? And can you think about a way to deal with these problems? The most well-known way to deal with these equivalence problems is resorting to value numbers. Value numbers are like hash codes of the nodes that we create. If we have a good hash function, we can ensure that every node that has the same operation label and the same list of input edges have um, the same hash. For instance, 
Let's try to find value numbers for our example DAG. The input nodes, each one get, uh, gets a different hash code. I represent these different codes as different nodes in the value number table. And then, when we compute new nodes, instead of using the names of the variables, we use their value numbers. As an example, the node that creates variable A will be formed by the operation label add plus the value numbers of node 1 and node 2. Notice that the operation has a value number 2, but I will omit it here just for the simplicity. And we can do like this for the other nodes too. So we always use the value number of a variable instead of the variable itself. And when we compute the value number of the seventh node, we notice that it's the same as the value number of node 5. So node 7 ends up being redundant. In this way, we can eliminate node 7 and refer to node 5 in its stead. And this algorithm can be greatly enhanced if we add the ability to recognize algebraic identities. Um, so that we can explore properties like commutativity and associativity. In this way, we have that 1 plus 2 equals 2 plus 1, for instance. There are many more identities that we can use. I'm showing a few in this figure. The more identities we add to our hash encoder, the more redundancies we are likely to find. In this example, again, we could eliminate the computation of variable d, but can you think about other optimizations that we can carry out in direct acyclic graphs that represent instructions within a basic block? Let me show you another optimization. Let's imagine that some nodes are marked as outputs. In this way, output nodes cannot be eliminated. If they have no use, for, uh, they might be used outside the basic block. In this example, nodes 5 and 6 are output nodes. Now, if a node has node sendent and it's not an output node, then it can be eliminated. This is called dead code elimination. As an example, if D is not an output node, we could eliminate it. But that's all that we could do in this case. However, if C is not an output node, then we can eliminate it. And we can also eliminate B. So this kind of algorithm is iterative. We keep eliminating nodes until every node's alive. I mean, either it's an output or has descendants. And with this discussion, I close this part of the course about directed acyclic graphs. In the next class, we shall talk about another kind of local optimization, the so-called family of pipihole optimizations. Until there, if you have questions or comments, you can drop me an email.